I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Kranz, who's an associate professor of radiology at Duke University Medical Center. And uh, he is going to talk about uh, 10 myths and misconceptions about SIH. Dr. Kranz. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I have 20 minutes and 10 myths, so this is about two minutes a, a myth. I'm going to have to speak as quickly as possible. All right, let's see. OK, so um, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, I may mention fiber and glue, and everybody should note that that is an off-label use of, of fiber and glue. So um, these are the 10 myths and misperceptions that I'm going to be speaking about. Um, some of these uh, are misconceptions that I had when I first uh, started treating um, patients with uh, intracranial hypotension, and I learned them the, the hard way. Uh, other ones uh, are ones that we see very commonly among patients who were referred to us. Uh, but these are sort of uh, uh, things that kept coming up on a repeated basis. Um, uh, that didn't seem to uh, make sense with uh, what, we, what we were seeing um, in our patient population. So um, I wanted to share some of these uh, uh, with you. So the first myth um, is that SIH is defined by low CSF pressure. And I think this has been uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, by a number of speakers uh, before, so I'm going to mention it only very briefly. but. Uh, I wanted to start with this case example. So here is a, a patient uh, that you can see has diffuse smooth dural enhancement, had this uh, brain MRI, uh, or sorry, the spine MRI that showed uh, CSF outside the fecal sac, so evidence of a high flow CSF leak. She's a 57-year-old woman with orthostatic headache, but her opening pressure was 25. Um, and um, so not only was it not low, but it was kind of on the, the borderline of, of being high. Um, she had an outside myelogram, which looked like this, which if you look very carefully, has an has a extradural CSF uh, collection. Um, this was the scout image from her CT myelogram. Um, and this is what we call North Carolina normal. Uh, uh, but you can see that the, the body habitus is, um, is uh, definitely larger than average. And I, it may be the case that this um, woman had um, underlying intracranial hypertension before she uh, started to leak. Uh, some more images, uh, you can see that there's clearly an active CSF leak at the same time that we measured that CSF pressure. There was this calcified disc that turned out to be at the site of leak. Uh, she had surgery um, with Dr. Shevink, and here is the, the dural hole. So despite the fact that her uh, CSF pressure was 25 centimeters of water, uh, she was actively leaking, um, actively leaking CSF. We, so we know that it can't be the case that all patients who have uh, 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 active CSF leak have low pressure. Um, and we know that it can't be the case that the symptoms are caused purely by a low CSF opening pressure. Uh, when we took a look at the patients uh, in our series uh, and um, we looked at, uh, I think, about 100 patients with uh, uh, intracranial hypotension, this is documented. ICHD3 positive intracranial hypotension. So a visible uh, brain MRI changes or uh, leak on, on myelography. It turns out that most people um, are actually sort of in the normal or low normal range uh, for um, their pressures. But uh, it was only a minority of patients who actually had a pressure of six or less. And there was also a, a smaller minority of patients who had pressures as high as 32 centimeters of water and were still actively leaking CSF with, with orthostatic headaches. So um, most people are actually in the normal range. Uh, you tend to have a higher CSF pressure the longer you leak. And based on your underlying body habitus, you may have a, a higher baseline CSF pressure. Uh, so there may be an abnormality of your relative CSF pressure, or you may have a relative decrease in CSF pressure compared with what your baseline normal is. But a single CSF pressure measurement um, is really of, of pretty limited utility. 
Uh, myth number two, SIH always causes orthostatic headache, and orthostatic headache is always due to SIH. So um, most patients have uh, orthostatic uh, headache, uh, and that is the case in, in uh, intracranial hypotension. However, uh, as we've seen earlier, a variety of other headache uh, patterns may be present, including second half of the day headache, non-positional headache, and some patients who have no headache at all. I saw a woman uh, about two weeks ago who had the worst dural enhancement I've, I've ever seen, um, and she had a uh, terrible brain sag, she had an active CSF leak, and uh, her symptoms were that she had a one out of 10 headache that was just above her right eye, and it would increase to about a three um, when, she, when she bent over. Um, but she really didn't have much in the way of disability or orthostatic headache. And we've seen some people who have no headache at all, patients who primarily have ear complaints like tinnitus. So it's not the case that headache is always orthostatic. Um, and the other thing I think that we've seen um, uh, some uh, conversation about today is that orthostatic headache uh, is sometimes hard to define. Um, it's hard to define what constitutes an orthostatic headache. And it's also hard uh, to know what do we do with patients who have uh, orthostatic headache but negative imaging. Um, I personally do think that I have seen cases that I think are um, patients who have POTS uh, physiology who don't have a CSF leak, and I would say that I think some of those patients have transient responses to um, uh, to blood patches, and I can hypothesize why that's the case, but, um, but nevertheless, um, there are some patients who have uh, cervicogenic headaches, and there, there are some patients who are just hard to classify. Um, they don't have any imaging evidence of intracranial hypotension. We don't really know how best to classify them. They don't respond to blood patches, and yet they have orthostatic headaches. So I think we have a problem. Uh, of patients who have orthostatic headaches and are imaging negative, and we don't really know what those people are. I think it would be wrong to say that they all have CSF leaks. I think it would be wrong to say that none of them have CSF leaks. Um, but I think, uh, I think we still have, uh, uh, have some work to do with those patients. Here's a patient uh, had dural enhancement, 56-year-old woman with ear pain and tinnitus, had no headache whatsoever, none at all. Um, she had uh, dural enhancement on her MRI, venous distension on her, um, uh, on her sagittal T2. She got a blood patch. The dural enhancement went away. The venous distension sign uh, has, has resolved. Her ear pain and tinnitus went away. I clearly think she had intracranial hypotension physiology. She responded to blood patching, but she never did have a headache. Myth number three, a negative brain MRI excludes the diagnosis. Um, I think that um, brain MRI is a great place to start. I think it's incredibly useful. Uh, it is specific. Um, and it is reasonably uh, good at detecting um, cases of intracranial hypotension, but it, it is certainly not perfect. And the longer patients have been symptomatic, the more likely it is that you'll have a uh, false negative. So here's a 55-year-old woman. She had orthostatic headache. Her brain MRI really looks normal. Um, but uh, she had a CT myelogram. I'm going to play this for you. This is a little video clip. And what you can see is that there is a leak uh, coming off of the nerve root sleeve. We treated that leak, her orthostatic headache went away. So clearly some patients uh, can have a negative brain MRI um, and still be leaking. Uh, we looked at, um, at the, the prevalence of these various imaging signs, found 83% 80, had dural enhancement, 61% had brain sagging, 75% had venous dissension. Um, and really that there was a very poor relationship between CSF pressure and any of these individual imaging signs. So it wasn't predicted by uh, having a high or low uh, CSF pressure uh, very well at all. Myth number four, this is one that, that seems to come up a lot in patients who seem to have a delayed diagnosis of intracranial hypotension. They'll have dural enhancement, diffuse smooth dural enhancement on their presenting brain MRI, and then they'll get a lumbar puncture to look for infection. Uh, this happens all the time. I'm here to tell you that if you have diffuse smooth uh, dural enhancement, uh, you do not have infectious meningitis. At least that, that is um, 
if you have infectious meningitis, it's completely unrelated to the diffuse smooth dural enhancement. So there's a number of things that can cause dural enhancement, things like uh, metastases, um, uh, what is what was formerly known as Wegner's uh, granulomatosis. I think Wegner was a Nazi, so we're not supposed to use his name anymore. Um, subdural uh, hemorrhages, prior surgery, sarcoidosis, uh, and idiopathic hypertrophic packing meningitis. None of these entities cause diffuse, smooth dural enhancement. Infectious meningitis is a typically leptomeningitis, not packing meningitis. Uh, so if you have packy meningitis, it, it is not that sort of stiff neck uh, in, infectious meningitis that people tend to get. The one exception to that rule is when the infection starts outside and comes in, like if you have infected sinuses or mastoid air cells, you'll get some local dural enhancement around a, a subdural or epidural empyema. Um, but and I hate to say nothing, but um, if you can find cases that, that prove this wrong, please submit them to me. But in my experience, nothing else besides intracranial hypotension causes diffuse smooth uh, dural enhancement. If it's truly diffuse and it's truly smooth, I think that's intracranial hypotension, and I don't really think there's a differential diagnosis for that. Myth number five, Chiari-1 is a feature of intracranial hypotension, and, and this is one that we see all the time and causes a lot of problems. So normally what we do is we're looking for evidence of brain sagging on uh, MR imaging, and here's an example of a normal MRI. You can see the uh, floor of the third ventricle sort of slopes up as you go posteriorly. The tonsils are not low. There's a good distance between the mammillary bodies and the pons. In this patient with brain sag, you've completely lost uh, the, um, that third ventricular slope. It's now the mammillary bodies are down below the, the, the back of the, um, uh, the uh, cella here. Um, and uh, the mammalopontine distance is, is very narrowed. So that's a, that's a case of brain sag. And brain sag and Chiari 1 are not the same. Um, here is a case of a patient uh, with uh, uh, cerebellar tonsil ectopia leading to presyrinx edema in the cervical spine. Um, but if you look carefully, you'll see that the mammillary bodies are sitting down uh, all the way at the bottom of the supracellular cistern, which is completely effaced. And this patient had diffuse dural enhancement. After treatment, you can see those mammillary bodies are elevated, the tonsils are elevated, the presyrinx edema is gone. Uh, and the dural enhancement is gone. This is not a case of Chiari malformation. And I would strongly urge, if there are any radiologists in the room, not to use Chiari malformation and tonsillar ectopia synonymously. If you put the word Chiari in your uh, report, somebody is going to try to do a suboccipital decompression on that patient. Even if you say this is a Chiari and I think it's due to intracranial hypotension, I promise you someone will try to do that, and that can have very bad consequences. So it turns out that tonsillar ectopia is not a specific finding. It can be seen in uh, some asymptomatic patients. It can be seen in about 20% of patients with IIH. Um, and in the context of intracranial hypotension, it can be seen in conjunction with brain sag. So here is a, a case from our, our friends at the, at the University of Cincinnati. This came from Mike Hazenfield. You can see this patient has uh, low cerebellar tonsils. There's some edema in the, uh, in the upper uh, spine here. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the mouse. Um, but this is brain sag. The mammillary bodies have descended way down. There's no remaining supracellular cistern. Well, somebody uh, decided to do a suboccipital decompression on this patient. And unfortunately, the cerebellum um, uh, herniated out uh, posteriorly, and this patient had a, had a very bad outcome. So it's very important to remember that tonsillar ectopia and Chiari uh, malformation are not synonymous, um, and, uh, and Chiari 1 is not a feature of intracranial hypotension. Myth number six, um, all leaks are caused by dural uh, diverticula or Tarlov cysts. This is one that we get all the time. Well, uh, I have some uh, diverticula or I have Tarlov cysts and I have headaches, so therefore uh, don't I, uh, doesn't that mean that I have intracranial hypotension or 
um, you know, there's a patient with intracranial hypotension and multiple cysts, shouldn't we be treating those cysts? Well, as, you, as you've learned from uh, several of the other speakers today, there are multiple different causes of uh, intracranial hypotension. Um, uh, and here in this patient, you can see there are actually some large uh, diverticula here. The, the source of the leak is actually this small uh, dural tear. Um, and there's this sort of fragile uh, uh, leptomeningeal protrusion through that dural tear. And these diverticula are completely incidental to what's going on. But um, in this case, this sort of leaking uh, uh, tear which sits at the axilla of the, the nerve root sleeve is the cause. And this is one of the first causes that was uh, recognized. But we've heard uh, that things like calcified thoracic discs, and even the entity of CSF to venous fistula, which is a relatively uh, new, uh, newly described uh, or newly recognized entity, um, are, are also causes that we should be thinking about. Um, I should say, too, that I have, I have seen maybe one leaking sacral Tarlov cyst. Um, I think uh, whether or not Tarlov cysts uh, actively uh, cause CSF leaks is controversial, but they're certainly not very common. So just because a patient has sacral Tarlov cysts, um, I, I would uh, be hesitant to uh, just make the instant uh, identification that, that the Tarlov cyst is, uh, is the cause of the leak. Yeah, so that's, that is a good question. So uh, Tarlov cysts are a histopathologically distinct entity, and they occur around the lumbosacral nerve roots. Um, and the, the nerve is actually in the wall of a Tarlov cyst. But it, practically speaking, we see these cysts down at the, at the level of the sacrum or the lower lumbar spine, and they're these sort of big, um, big cysts that sometimes remodel the sacrum uh, down inferiorly. Most of the time when we see leaking uh, diverticula or outpouchings, they occur in the thoracic area, sometimes the, the lower, uh, the, the upper lumbar region, but they're not these big sacral Tarlov uh, cysts that, that are seen uh, frequently. Um, myth number seven, spinal imaging rarely reveals the uh, CSF leak. I, I hear this a lot, why do spinal imaging? It never shows anything. But I think um, if you look at uh, data from a number of series uh, and you take patients with bona fide or, or um, clearly documented cases of intracranial hypotension who meet uh, ICHD3 criteria or some other diagnostic criteria, about at least 50% of those patients uh, will show uh, a leak on, um, on imaging. Um, and uh, the caveat to that is that they can be subtle. So uh, you do have to be attuned to what kinds of things you're looking for. This is a patient um, who had a CT myelogram uh, that was read as negative um, at an outside institution. I've uh, zoomed in on the area that I really uh, want to highlight here, which is this uh, diverticulum of the nerve root sleeve with this little halo of a slightly more um, diffuse contrast around it. And when we look at that on some thin section coronal imaging, what we can see is that you can see the diverticulum, but there's actually a small low flow CSF leak coming off the bottom of that uh, nerve root sleeve. That was surgically repaired and the, the patient got better, uh, had complete resolution of symptoms. Um, so you do have to uh, pay attention to the technique of the imaging and things I think that are particularly important are scanning as soon as possible after introduction of contrast. We do ours in about um, uh, two to two minutes or so after the contrast goes in, thin section imaging, good breath hold technique. Uh, a myelogram is not a myelogram is not a myelogram. You have to have good, good quality um, uh, technique there. Um, and here's a case uh, uh, where uh, there's this uh, myelogram. It looks like it's normal, uh, except there was this little thing off to the side here that we couldn't quite explain. It didn't seem to be calcium. I didn't really know what it was. Um, we wound up doing a, uh, a, a lateral decubitus myelogram in this patient. We actually saw these veins that were opacifying across the midline um, and uh, down at additional uh, spinal levels. And this was a CSF to venous fistula. And what you're seeing here is contrast in the epidural venous plexus. So they can be uh, quite subtle at times. <clears throat> 
Um, this one has been addressed before, but uh, skull base CSF leaks uh, cause intracranial hypotension. It, it, it always makes me think of a water tower. This is downtown Durham. You've got this beautiful Lucky Strike water tower, which I think they, pre they uh, preserved just so I would have something to talk about it at meetings. Um, but this is the head, this is your head, and it's this big container of fluid which sits on this really small stalk uh, of fluid that goes down, which is your spinal column. Um, and uh, the pressure at the bottom here is much higher than the pressure at the top uh, when upright. And uh, this has been uh, described before. We've heard about the hydrostatic indifference point. And there's another point called the zero pressure point, or the Z, uh, ZPP or the ZPS, which is where your pressure in your spinal column is equal to atmospheric pressure. So when you're above that point, and this is usually in the cervical spine, uh, the, the pressure is negative relative to atmospheric pressure, and below that point, the pressure is positive uh, relative to atmospheric uh, pressure, which is why if you have a skull-based CSF leak, you don't tend to leak when you're upright because the pressure in your head is negative relative to the atmospheric pressure when you're upright. Now, if you want to make somebody with a skull-based CSF leak, um, as, as I do when I do a cisternogram, you have them put their head down between their, their knees, and frequently that provocative maneuver causes them to start uh, leaking CSF. That's what we do in patients who we're doing cisternograms on. Um, but, um, but when they're upright, they, they don't tend to leak, uh, and for that reason, they don't tend, unless they're just pouring out CSF uh, and really become volume depleted. Uh, they don't tend to have orthostatic headaches. They may have headaches, but they don't tend to have orthostatic headaches. And we don't routinely look for skull-based CSF leaks in patients with intracranial hypotension because we don't find them. And Dr. Shevink uh, has, has written this up uh, uh, previously. Um, myth number nine, uh, blood patch immediately cures uh, intracranial hypotension. So. Uh, many of us are familiar with post-lumbar puncture headache. Those patients usually are symptomatic only for a couple of days before they get a blood patch. They get the blood patch and they feel better right away. Well, the physiology is a little bit different if you've been leaking for uh, three months or six months or nine months or longer. And in my experience, patients don't recover uh, right away. Typically, it takes a little bit more time. And I usually look for about a 50, at least a 50% improvement, but only over the course of the first week. So I usually don't tell patients, if you don't feel better instantaneously, then that means, you know, anything prognostically. I usually give it um, uh, a couple days to see how their, their headaches are doing. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Dr. Friedman uh, talked uh, uh, a lot about this, um, so I won't belabor this point. After the blood patch, the job is done. You give them a blood patch, everybody gets better, and it's easy. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case, certainly not in the patient population who we see. So intracranial hypotension is a low pressure, low volume state. Um, rebound high pressure, the, the patients often don't have an elevated CSF pressure, it's a relative increase in their, in their pressure. Intracranial hypotension worse when upright, rebound worse when down, uh, often occipital in uh, SIH and often frontal or periorbital or sometimes at the vertex or whole head, but a change in headache uh, description when um, uh, with rebound. Uh, nausea is common and onset after the blood patch. I'm going to skip this slide because Dr. Friedman talked about that. Uh, so we put these uh, 10 myths and some of the supporting data into this review article, which is in, um, in headache if you're interested. And finally, I would just say um, that uh, I, there's a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain, and that is that um, it's not the things that you don't know that get you into trouble. It's the things that you know for sure that just ain't so. Um, so I'm willing to uh, admit that some of these might be proved wrong in the future. I think uh, it's always possible uh, as we learn more about uh, this condition. Uh, but uh, as it stands, uh, I think these are the most common myths that we see. So thanks for your attention.